Okay, uh, good morning, uh, participants. Um, hope you are well rested uh, and ready for this uh, day three session for the last day of the Biopharma Pacific Virtual Training on Other Effective Area-Based Conservation Measures, or OECMs. Again, I'd like to thank you for, for your participants, uh, your participation and the contributions of the last two days. Um, I think it's been very, very great. And just uh, if you're joining us for the first time today, uh, welcome. And we're happy to have you with us. Um, and hopefully uh, the, the last uh, day in a session uh, of the training will be useful for you as well. Just uh, in terms of recap of uh, the sessions yesterday, I think we had, uh, we, del we dived uh, straight ahead straight into um, you know, the methodology and it was really, really good uh, to, to have the group discussions around, um, you know, putting together a tentative lists of potential OECM. So it's really, really great to, to um, that uh, each of the groups were able to do that. Um, and, and also familiarizing initially with the uh, um, identification methodology for, for OECMs in the region. So I'm happy uh, that you know, in doing that also it made a, a generated some uh, discussion or some uh, started to get some new thinking on a lot of the issues uh, surrounding um, uh, these areas and how they uh, could potentially be dealt with uh, also in terms of your own national contexts, uh, laws, policies, and, and governance systems. Um, so uh, our program for today is is not that that uh, different from yesterday. We will be having some more discussions on on, on um, the the uh, OECMs and really just looking at uh, more of the legal considerations um, uh, surrounding these areas, as well as um, uh, uh, assessing uh, those areas that. Uh, that have been identified at the national level as potential OECMs. Then we will also be looking uh, at next steps. I think that's probably one of the most important things is where do we move forward from here? Um, and what we need and what do we need to do and what sort of support that you will need from us in the coming months in order to um, get the process rolling and, um, within your own respective jurisdictions. Uh, so with that, uh, I thank you once again for joining us for this day three uh, session of the training. And I would like to kick off uh, today's session with a presentation from our colleague Stacy Jupiter uh, on the importance of governance authority consent. So uh, with those words, uh, over to you, Stacy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vi. Good morning, colleagues. Hope you're all doing very well today. I apologize if you hear some background noise. It's raining quite hard in Suva and there's a leaky gutter just outside my window, but hopefully the Zoom filter will reduce that in the background and I'll try to speak up. I just have a, a very quick presentation this morning to really highlight the importance of the local governance authority consent to be able to move a site from a potential OECM that you've identified through the screening process to a candidate OECM that can go through a full assessment. So most of you would be familiar with the term free prior and informed consent. It's a specific right that um, the original term specifically pertains to indigenous people being recognized in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. But I've highlighted here in the context of OECMs, FPIC, free prior and informed consent needs to apply with respect to any local governance authority, not just that of indigenous peoples. This applies across the board, whether a site is being managed by private sector, local community, um, or a, a local governance authority. So I just wanted to go through some of the sort of best practice principles for free prior and informed consent. Getting consent doesn't just mean going to a sole spokesperson from a community or a company that happens to be managing that area. As most of you are aware, when that happens in the Pacific, that tends to result in a lot of conflict if the decision hasn't been discussed and agreed upon by the broader group that's involved in the management and um, how an area is, is used. 
So some of these principles include be as broad and inclusive as possible in terms of the number of people that are involved in the conversations about whether or not the site should move forward as an OECM and include as many different parts and sectors of that community or within the organization that's managing as possible. You need to really be clear and transparent about the information that's being delivered and make sure that it's delivered in language that's accessible to all participants. Sometimes um, we tend to use a lot of technical jargon that local people can't understand very well. So just be clear about the messages that are being delivered, particularly the expectation for the roles and responsibilities of that governance authority should this site move to be an OECM. A main key best practice principle is to make sure that you have plenty of time for discussion to enable dialogue, talk story, allow people the opportunity to present their rules. This usually takes about four times as long and costs about six times as much as you are budgeting for to begin with, but being aware of that from the beginning can help with your planning. In particular, when you're engaging with indigenous people and local communities, try to engage existing structures in the community to be able to reach out to as many people as possible. So things like church groups, women's groups, chiefly in customary groups can help organize and bring people together to have these conversations. Make sure you're having conversations about how local rights will or will not be recognized with a designation of OECMs. Um, this may vary depending on the legal framework in each country, and we can talk about that later. Um, and you know, review the best practices and challenges when local rights are and are not recognized um, as a site is designated. And another very good um, best practice is to try to include a process to address grievances. Make sure that there's a way that people can file a complaint and potentially think about a process to remove a site from OECM designation if being designated or recognized as an OECM ends up creating conflict. So one key thing that I mentioned before is it's during these conversations, it's very important to talk to the local governance authority about their rights and responsibilities that will come into force once the area is officially recognized as an OECM. So a governance authority, they can self-identify as a potential OECM. They can assess it themselves or they can seek independent support to determine whether that area qualifies. And then that authority also, if it's nominated from the outside as a potential OECM, they have the absolute right to object to that external nomination or recognition anytime throughout the process. But the key point here is that once recognized that governance authority has a heightened responsibility to govern and manage the area for the long term in areas in ways that achieve in situ conservation of biodiversity. This slide is just a reminder of the things that we've talked about over the past couple of days about how a site moves from a potential OECM by going through that screening process. It doesn't become a candidate OECM until the local governance authority has consented to it being assessed against the CBD criteria. And only then can the assessment take place. And then we're going to talk more and hear more from Heather about the reporting requirements. But I just wanted to note here that reporting a site to the WDPA also requires consent from that local governance authority. So area-based measures that qualify as protected areas or OECMs should in principle be reported to the WDPA or the OECM database respectively. And this reporting always needs to be done with free prior and informed consent. So I put up a question here, which was my question in particular that I asked Harry, but there isn't one specific firm answer to, but it's something that possibly we can talk about in a little bit and maybe you can have a think about how this would apply or not in the countries and territories where you are living. So what would happen if a local governance authority consents for a site to be recognized in a OECM and be reported, but the national authority does not? So things to think about, this situation is likely to be context specific and very much is going to have to do with, especially in the case of indigenous people and local communities, 
whether that national authority recognizes the rights of the local governance authority, first of all, to exist as an institution, and whether they recognize the rights of that local governance authority to manage that space. Um, just to point out, there's a large body of law policy and practice that have yet to be developed around OECMs. Um, being part of this conversation about how that law and policy is developed can help iron out issues like this before they come rise to the surface. And so it's important to get involved to help shape this conversation so we can try to minimize those conflicts if and when they do arise. So I'm gonna stop there and then we'll pass it on to Heather. But again, let's feel free to talk about this some more over the next hour or so, so we can get at your questions and try to envision different scenarios. So thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you for, for, for that uh, informative uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to hand it over to our colleague, uh, Heather Bingham, uh, to introduce the next, the next item. Uh, so over to you, um, uh, Heather, thank you. Thanks, Vi. I'm just going to share my screen one second. So uh, this session is basically about um, the actual assessment process that you would go through uh, with a given potential OECM. Um, and the questions um, that we want to work through are firstly, uh, who, should conduct, who should conduct the assessment? So who should be involved in assessing whether a potential OECM is in fact an OECM? Um, and also what kinds of things should be considered during that process? Um, I want to conduct this as kind of a, a group discussion. Um, so it's not gonna be a lot of me talking. I'd quite like to get your ideas and your uh, perspectives from your national contexts on how this might work um, within your countries um, and who would need to be involved. Um, so obviously Stacey has just spoken about the importance of getting the, the consent of the governance authority, um, but uh, it would be great to also think about which um, which agencies or experts or, or, or other groups um, in, in your countries would need to be involved. Um, so does anyone want to kind of start us off with any ideas? Um, stay, um, sorry, Heather, if I may, uh, Participants, this, this session is meant to be run as an as a open plenary discussion. So um, while, while Heather is given uh, some, some guiding points on, on, on this issue, uh, if you have any specific uh, um, points or any you know, thinking from the last two days that you'd like to contribute, uh, you can either put it in the chat or, or you can um, uh, ask uh, or, or raise it directly uh, uh, here. So thank you. Thanks, Vi. Say good morning, Heather. Just to clarify, when you say the assessment, you mean like the assessment of whether or not the site should be an OECM, like the screening thing we did yesterday? Yeah, so once you've um, established that a, a site might be a potential OECM or is a potential OECM um, and you have the consent of the governance authority, this is kind of about what the next steps are. So you're ready to conduct an assessment. Um, who do you need to bring on board and what kinds of things do you need to consider um, in doing that? Thanks, Fred. Uh, Heather, I just want to ask also from, from my own personal ignorance, um, you know, uh, so when the, the, the OECM assessment uh, phase is that, that comes, so is that for individual areas that, that would be derived from this uh, potential list? For example, like what, what the groups put together yesterday? Yeah, so um, I think we can, the, the exercise is kind of framed around what you would do in order to assess an individual site, but we can definitely also talk about um, the, the kind of national level process. So that process of um, who should be involved to start looking into which types of sites at national level might be OECMs to kind of start producing that list from which um, you work down to the site level. Um, so really either of those scales is, is relevant. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. And I'd just like to call out the, the, the team from the Cook Islands, uh, Haley. Uh, Haley, I, I know if you're online, I know there, there was some uh, enthusiasm or, or if I recall correctly in one of, one of the uh, correspondences that you uh, did mention that you guys were, were, were uh, you know, at least ready to, to move forward with, with the OECM process. If that is correct, and, and if you do have any views on, on this particular issue and how it can be moved forward within your own uh, national context. Thanks for that, Vi. Thanks, Heather. Um, yeah, so we basically went through an exercise um, over the last year as part of one of our JAF projects um, that was looking at our protected areas, and in doing so, it helped us understand and define a bit better our OECMs as well and how they're separate to our protected areas. Um, one of the challenges we have is that we've got 15 islands within the Cook Islands that are all um, quite remote and dispersed. Um, and so ensuring that the information we have on what we believe are, I guess, potential OECMs, um, it, it's just a bit of a challenge for us to update that information at present. Um, but in saying that, um, that's where um, the assessments with the traditional leaders and communities um, and the island councils is really important. Um, so I think in regards to this question of who should conduct the assessment, I think for us at the National Environment Service being the focal point and the ones reporting um, to the databases, we're in a good position and haven't gone through this training to lead those discussions, um, but for sure it needs to be with, with the island councils um, and those involved on the ground. Brilliant. And I don't I, we've got more of the team on the call as well, so I don't know if Liz or those guys want to add anything else for our Cook Island perspective. Uh, thank you for that. Um, just to add to what Haley have highlighted, um, we, as we all know, that the um, Cook Islands EEZ is a marae mona, uh, a marine protected area, and um, <coughs> this has been established under the Marae Mona Act 2017. So that would be one of the agencies that will be. Um, responsible in uh, conducting this uh, assessment. Um, we also talked about um, some of the ministries. Um, it depends where the OECMs are. If it's marine, so uh, Ministry of Marine Resources will also be um, uh, conducting the assessment, um, not only here in Rautana, but also in the outer islands. Uh, when, you, when you look at terrestrial, when you're looking at traditional leaders, uh, like what Haley have highlighted, the island councils on these islands, and uh, environmental, environment NGOs. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I think this is really helping to get us thinking about the the kind of diversity of, of people who might need to be involved. So obviously we have um, government ministries, potentially several different ministries and agencies, um, but also um, community councils, community groups. Um, Nate uh, and, um, and a couple of other people also mentioned um, NGOs uh, potentially could be could be uh, helpful in the process. Uh, there are some areas where you might potentially want to involve biodiversity experts uh, or indeed uh, holders of traditional knowledge. Um, and of course, um, I mean, Stacey emphasised the need to, to involve governance authorities. I think it's, it's important to keep in mind uh, that that could be uh, a, a really diverse range of different groups. So we've, we've talked a lot about local communities, but could also be private sector companies. It could be for-profit companies or it could be uh, NGOs um, or even individual landholders who could potentially be, be uh, managing OECMs. 
So there's a lot of different um, people who might potentially need to be involved. Um, and I guess, oh, sorry, there's one more in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So Alfred says um, that uh, it can be a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, people who have, who have the necessary information for the assessment and also those who own and have tenure rights, uh, including relevant government agencies. That's a great point. Um, so bringing in everyone who, who needs to um, have a say because they're going to be affected by it, but also bringing in the people who have relevant expertise that might help with the assessment itself. I think that's really helpful. Um, so that kind of brings us on to the next question. Um, sorry, there's more coming in in the chat now. <laughs> uh, okay, so Agnetha says, uh, for Solomon Islands, uh, government authorities, including environment, uh, forestry, fisheries, etc., partner NGOs, community-based organizations, Academia partners, that's one that hasn't come up yet, but um, potentially falls into this category of people who might have expertise that could inform the assessment. Uh, provincial governments, another great point. So often they're going to be um, either, um, you know, have a lot of expertise on local areas or even be the governance authority themselves. Um, and local, again, local leaders, uh, community leaders and facilitators and practitioners trained. Um, I think facilitators is a really good point. That's not one that's come up um, yet, um, but it's it's certainly going to be something to think about whether um, the assessment process is going to require a facilitator um, and exactly what their role might be and which group they should be representing. Um, so that's something else certainly to consider. Uh, Lino says, um, local government with the help of landowners and NGOs that have the capacity to do the assessment. Again, very great points. Uh, one second. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep a note of everything while I go along. Uh, resource owners, another great point. So certainly um, stakeholders and rights holders um, anyone who's going to be affected by uh, change, well, either recognition of certain resource rights or um, anything that's going to affect who or how um, they can access resources definitely needs to be involved. Uh, so, Rolena says for Vanuatu, governments, NGOs, academia, local experts, uh, landowners and local biologists. Again, a great, uh, great set of suggestions. So does anyone have any further thoughts on, on all of that before we move on to the next bit? Not seeing anything else come in. Um, uh, Heather, I just wanted to um, raise an issue about, before we move on, and I don't know if it's uh, what, what your next question is going to be, but I was also wanting to gauge um, the role of, of regional NGOs in, in or whether they would be involved uh, in the actual, because I know, I mean, for example, uh, Alfred, uh, you mentioned uh, to me recently that OECMs is, is uh, an important part of your 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 work plan, or or it's going to be uh, now that we have this guidance uh, uh, rolling out now in the region. But I was wondering because you know uh, a lot of these uh, NGO big NGOs who have um, country programs and, and and work on the ground also. Uh, so what is uh, also the potential role and contribution? Uh, but I, I just wanted to, to throw this out to Alfred from WWF uh, Pacific uh, for your perspectives on this. Uh, thanks, uh, Vi. Um, and yes, I, I think uh, 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 the role that organizations such as WWF can provide is that we could actually work with the 
the local authorities um, and the re relevant uh, local organizations uh, to identify um, OECMs. Um, and one of the of the ways that we can do that is that we can act as facilitators or conveners, uh, even uh, to provide uh, to look for funding to 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 finance um, the process, um, and also to provide a technical advice. Um, um, and um, whether it's going to be scientific um, um, advice or support or policy support, uh, depending on the, the capacity of the, of the organization. So these are some of the things that um, the organization can, um, I mean, regional uh, or international NGOs could actually provide uh, with, a, with a wide range of, uh, of uh, presence uh, around the globe. Uh, we could also, you know, look at, uh, at um, similar exercises uh, happening in, in similar situations from other parts of the globe uh, and share lessons and, um, and best practices uh, um, and those. And also, you know, um, uh, looking not just at uh, bilateral funding and public funding, but also um, private uh, financial institutions as well. Thank you, Alfred, for, for thank you for that for that perspective. Uh, I'll hand it over back to you, Heather. Thank you. Thanks, Brian, Alfred. That's a really good point, um, and I think. Um, an important thing to consider. Certainly there are um, regional and international NGOs with expertise on, on OECMs who certainly uh, could perform that facilitation and convening uh, and sort of capacity building role where needed. Um, so that's another, another great point. Um, okay, so uh before we unless there's any other final points on that sorry yeah i just wanted to ask uh from our colleagues our other colleagues like for, well for, for our colleagues from tonga do you have anything to add uh, to this or fsm and, and other participants who are uh, uh, online before we move on to the next bit Hello. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Well, is that you, Dave? Yeah, yeah, it's me. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Well, what I've seen in this, uh, where the point is that it's already written there what uh, I actually done. It. The agencies and organizations, and also funding institutions that need to contact the assessment. Sorry, Dave, it's a little bit hard to hear you. Was that convening associations? Yes, well, the, my point is I don't have any additional. Uh, because it's it's written in there. Right. It's okay. Thank you. And organization managing the site, and also, if possible, the funding agency. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So before moving on to. Thank the you, Dave. Before moving on to the next bit, um, I just wanted to, again, just draw your attention to decision 14.8 of the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, because it has a lot of guidance that uh, is helpful on these points. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, to draw your attention to one particular point from, from that decision, which is um, recognition of other effective area-based conservation measures should follow appropriate cons consultation with relevant governance authorities, landowners, rights owners, stakeholders, and the public. So really this is exactly what we've all just been saying. Um, it was also reflected in Stacey's presentation, of course. Um, and it's um, just making the point that there is already um, a lot of guidance out there and uh, CBD decision 14.8 and also the IUCN guidance is potentially gonna be very, very helpful as you're kind of thinking through 
uh, these processes. So the next bit is what should be considered. So we've kind of we've we've established who should be involved in the process of assessing an OECM, um, but um, what kinds of things do we need to think about? So um, this is sort of how to involve people, how to ensure they have the information they need, uh, timelines, expectation management, all of these kinds of things. So um, feel free to uh, chip in. Um, Heather, so you're, you're, when, you, when you refer to issues here, are you referring back to uh, that paragraph or that decision that you just showed about is it issues around consent uh, with the governance authority or is it uh, much more wider than that? Yeah, so that could definitely be a consideration, but um, I'm thinking kind of more broadly. Um, so if you were if you were planning to assess an OECM, um, what kinds of things might you need to consider? So obviously getting the consent of the governance authority is a very important one, um, but what other things might you need to, to think about, um, such as how to ensure the people who are gonna be consulted have all the information they need, um, what kind of process to go through? So, um, you know, would it be, meetings, consultations, workshops, um, other, um, it would, I mean, if, if, um, if any of you have already kind of started thinking through the process, it would be great to, to hear your perspectives. Yeah, uh, yeah, just going back to that, I, I think um, uh, Stacy's uh, earlier presentation did, did raise a, a pretty, some pretty good issues, uh, if the participants recall. I think uh, some of the detail uh, with the free and prior informed consent uh, um, requirement uh, uh, are things that, you know, we really should, should keep in mind um, uh, because it, uh, it could be a long and drawn out process, but it's something nevertheless that, that needs to be done. Yeah, very true. Um, so I suppose other things, um, one, one particular one I suppose might be kind of managing expectations. So if you're proposing to a community that they uh, consider assessing the area they manage as an OECM, um, what would they, what information would they need in terms of what that's going to mean for them? Um, what questions that might they have about the implications it will have? Um, and what's, what do you need to do to ensure that they, A, understand how it's going to affect them and B, understand what's not going to happen. So if there's an expectation of um, a huge amount of funding and that's not actually uh, a possibility. Um, how, how is that communicated, that kind of thing? So Nate says, uh, give a clear picture of the options and include a roadmap so they can see uh, what they'll be responsible for and what the impacts are. I think that's a really good point, um, particularly if there's going to be an expectation of um, uh, in monitoring or um, any kinds of changes that might be expected to the management that's already going on. Um, what will be the indicators of effectiveness and equity and how best to measure this? Again, very important um, links to monitoring um, and also how to incorporate local knowledge and worldviews also very important. Uh, land ownership issues, that's a good point. Uh, so there are some cases in Samoa where the high chief of a family gives consent, but the extended families don't, family members don't agree. That's a great point. Comes back to um, Stacy's point about ensuring that consultation is uh, fully participatory and doesn't just rely on uh, kind of single individuals 
providing their consent. Uh, Rolena says involve landowners, chiefs, province and resource owners, uh, include them in consultations and the results of any assessments must be reported back to them. Really, really good point, of course. Um, we've talked a lot about getting consent before doing the assessment and getting consent before reporting data, but obviously it's also hugely important that um, communities are involved in determining the outcome and understand what the outcome is. Um, and any implications going forward from that. Uh, so we have uh, making sure the right people are involved, for example, the landowners. That's a great point. Um, presenting the range of conservation management options, so OECM, LMMA, uh, protected areas, et cetera, would be important. So I think that's a really good point, actually. So if there's, um, if we're looking at a site where that actually there might be a number of ways in which it could be recognized, of which OECM is, is just one, um, and there might be different implications depending on which one of those recognition paths is taken, then of course, hugely important to, to communicate that to the governance authority. Um, and again, to get their consent for whatever form of recognition is, is being proposed. Uh, so bottom up approach, uh, reef owners uh, up to government involvement. Yep, that's another good one. Um, there's a lot coming in now. I hope I haven't missed anything. Do do tell me if I miss something. Um, um, I think um, Heather. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I just want to add something to the discussion, and uh, maybe something to to get uh, the participants uh, also thinking about. I think there's been some really great um, um, suggestions and feedback coming through uh, the chat. Uh, this was back to to that question that that um, Stacy. Uh, posed in a presentation about, you know, if we do get, uh, you know, FPIC from, from the local governance authority, but what if uh, the national government doesn't provide the consent? So I think that some, uh, uh, Stacy did outline a, a, a number of points below that, but I was also wondering, uh, you know, uh, and to get participants thinking from, from their own situations of how they could um, sort of uh, address the situation or work or work around it. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Vi. Does anyone um, have any thoughts about that, about how it might be handled in, in your countries? Just while um, people are thinking about that, there's a couple more that have come in. Um, one about involving youth. Um, again, another really good point. Um, obviously involving um, all kind of stakeholder groups who, who might be affected or who might be involved in the governance of, of the OECM is, is really important. Um, ensuring it's participatory, that's vital. Uh, Nate uh, missed the question. So the question, Nate, was um, about this issue of um, if there was a situation where the governance authority of a potential OECM wanted to recognise it as an OECM and gave their consent for that, but the national authorities uh, didn't, so didn't uh, recognise it as an OECM. So the question was how, um, how that could be dealt with or resolved um, in, in the countries that people are representing here today. So Agnetha says, uh, make it a consultative and inclusive process. Um, all groups within communities, users and owners, yes, very important. Uh, landowners and resource owners, men, women, youth, traditional leaders, rights holders, uh, and others. 
uh, those with customary interests, provincial government, members of provincial assemblies, uh, national government and relevant ministries. That's a fantastic, uh, very comprehensive list, all very good points. Running out of space now. So good morning. Can I um, share an experience? So in Papua New Guinea, on the north coast of Papua New Guinea in Medang province, um, for many years, there's been about five or six communities that have set up been uh, looking after the turtles. So there's some turtles that nest on the beach there. And they've, um, through another NGO group, they've um, some years ago established these conservation deeds, which the community signed and agreed upon and kind of have a, a framework of this is what we're going to do and this is who's involved and, you know, kind of some pretty rough sketch maps of, of, of their area and whatnot. So those conservation deeds sort of, I think gave the community some sense that they've set up this conservation area, but then the provincial government doesn't really have any recognition of it. Like they don't know where to put it. Mm -hmm. And to, to be honest, the provincial government's not very, doesn't have very high capacity anyways. So I wonder if, and, that, and like, so they have these conservation deeds, but they're not, they don't really have any teeth. So like there's been some logging recently that's encroached upon their boundaries. It's like, well, tough luck. You know, there's just no teeth to it. So, you know, to this question about if the community says, okay, we're going to have an OECM, but then the national government doesn't know where to put it or doesn't have a place to recognize it. I, I, that's a really burning question for me that I can't quite get past. Um, that's great the community wants to do that, but then if the national government doesn't put it into their system or the national government resists it because they've got their protected areas policy or, you know, they kind of have, want to take control over things. So I don't know, I don't know how to make that work. I'm really stuck on it, thanks. Thanks, Nate. I think that's a, that's a great kind of illustration of, um, how you know the, the issues that could potentially come up um i think it is going to be i mean it's going to be a process for everybody um governments and other stakeholders are are still um coming to to grips with getting to grips with the um the concept of oecms um and it's it's going to have to be a very uh participatory and collaborative process because it affects so many different governance actors um, and I think there's a there's a lot of value in communicating the potential benefits that OECMs could have from the local to the national to the global level. Um, and um, hopefully, in many cases, there'll be um, it'll be sort of uh, seen as something that's positive at all those levels. Um, but certainly, that's not inevitable. And there may well be cases where there are disagreements. So, if anyone else has any other sort of perspectives on that, it would be really interesting to hear. Hi, um, so Alfred from uh, WWF, I think um, um, it's, it's, it's quite important for us to actually look at um, the tenorship of the land or the resources um, and recognize the importance of uh, the rights of the indigenous people and uh, the owners of the land to be able to participate in the management. Uh, and uh, the use of the resources within their own uh, territories. And I think um, um, it's, I, I, I have not uh, come across this um, in, in my work here in Fiji, but I think, you know, we can look at other indigenous peoples and local communities um, in other parts of the world and see how, and I know that there's uh, uh, such conflicts actually usually arises in, in places like in uh, Latin America and we can learn from the experiences, but I think this goes um, beyond um, the work that we do in terms of policy and uh, um, and uh, advocating 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 for legislation review and changes to ensure that the rights of indigenous people and local communities are reflected in in laws and protected, but also taking this to the highest level, such as the convention itself, um, um, and and that is something that we need to to to, to take into consideration. 
uh, ensuring that, um, and also some of the comments that I'm reading on the chat, you know, uh, important, very, very important to, uh, to include um, uh, local communities um, and, the, and recognizing the traditional governance structure and knowledge and ensuring that also women are a strong part of that um, uh, included as part of the consultation process. Uh, and that is something that we as uh, organizations need to continue to champion and advocate and push for. Yeah, all oh, very, very good points. Thank you. Um, Heather, I just want to draw attention to um, the point that uh, Tonga made uh, in the chat, I think, uh, because they have a very uh, specific uh, uh, situation where the monarchy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they, uh, I mean, the nobles have uh, absolute uh, authority over the land. I guess where we're, uh, and then, uh, I mean, uh, apart from areas that they gift uh, to uh, the rest of the community. Uh, but I think, you know, I just want to raise that, yeah, their situation is a bit different. And so I, I'm wondering, uh, I want to hear from Lahaina, you know, on what what ideas or or, or any sort of um, perspectives you have in, in order to move this issue forward uh, within Tama itself. Lahaina, are you there? Oh, sorry. Yes, I am. Can you? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, did you get my question? Yeah. Uh, so, um, okay. Go ahead. Our, thank you. Our our nobles are very educated and they are willing for change. It's just a matter of um, uh, approaching it in the proper manner of like presenting it to them and the ideas that we have for like all these conservation areas. Um, but they, yes, they are willing for change, but it's, we just need to approach it in a certain way that it not only uh, benefits the environment and everything, but also cultural. Uh, we need to like relate it back to our cultural ways as well and traditions. So yeah, did I answer your question, Bai? Yeah, no, that, that's quite clear. So um, you, you're saying that, but, but um, because uh, we were talking about, um, uh, you know, consent, uh, full, uh, free and prior informed consent processes and, and uh, you know, inclusive participatory uh, uh, consultations. So for, for Tonga, is it correct to say that, that the, the nobles are the ones who will give that consent? Yes, yes, you're very uh, right with that point. Okay. Because I, I do understand there, there are some uh, other pockets of land that uh, are, are owned by, uh, there is some, some areas that, that uh, some communities or villages own or have ownership over right now, or is, is I'm not sure I'm correct with that point. So majority of the communities here in Tonga, they are run by the nobles. And in order to go into that area, we need to present something to the nobles in order to uh, have their community involved. And then we also have the village uh, district offices as well. Sorry. Um, we also have the district offices for each community. Oh my gosh. And um, so basically in order to do the outreach into all the other communities, we need to like go through all the proper steps and then from the district officer to the nobles and then to the community straight forward, yeah. So would there be cases where communities are kind of de facto governing certain areas or is it always the case that it's, it's very much the nobles making the decisions? Very much the nobles making the decision. Okay, interesting, I was just curious. Um, I've got one other at a time. Um, I think, although this is, we're a really great discussion. I think we might need to wrap it up so that we can move on. Um, does anyone have any final points they wanted to make just before we, we uh, move to the next session?
I, I was a, this is Stacey. Hi, I was writing one comment, but it was getting long, so it may just be easier to say it. Just in terms of scenarios where there might be a disconnect between what a local community wants and what a higher level provincial or national governance authority gives consent to happen. I mean, one potential scenario to think about is that there could be cases where local communities want to use the OECM recognition process as a way to secure rights over an area. And they may potentially be looking for to do that for motivations just about securing rights and not necessarily about biodiversity conservation. And it may be worth always just checking that that local community does in fact have the rights over that area on the side of the national government um, because you know, in particular in other parts of the world, not just in the Pacific, there may be false claims for those rights to manage a certain area. Thanks, Stacey. Hey, thanks, Stacey. So on that point, so if a community is chasing, it's gonna pers pursuing the OACM because see, they say they, okay, we're gonna get rights over our land. Okay, that's great, but does that meet the, requirements of an OECM? I mean, shouldn't, aren't there other things that, like, the, they can't get away with just having the, their rights, they actually have to do some other stuff too, correct? Of course, yeah, of course, yeah. On the other so side I guess that would be important yeah. to make sure that they're, they know that, like, okay. Absolutely, you know, yeah, absolutely. Not just, I mean, on, this isn't on the, the other table. side of this, true, uh, too, is, is a point to look at is, um, you know, there is potential to that a higher level governance authority could deny indigenous communities who do have rightful claims to an area if for some reason they didn't recognize those rights. That could happen also. So just something to think about. Um, as I say, I'm loath to, to cut this short because it's a really great discussion, um, but I think we do need to move on. So I'm going to hand back to Vi at this point, um, but thank you all for the really helpful inputs and I'll share all of the um, very messy notes I've been making with you later. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, uh, colleagues, participants, for the excellent uh, discussions uh, that we've had uh, on the agenda item three. I will be moving on to the next uh, agenda item four, uh, and I'm going to hand it over to our colleague, Harry Jonas. Again, uh, this will be run similar to item three, where uh, there will be a short uh, presentation, and then we will have uh, a discussion around that. Uh, again, uh, feel free to, to put uh, your questions, observations, or anything you would like to add into the chat window following the, the presentation by Harry. So over to you, Harry. Thank you. Hi again, everybody. Great. Um, so, because OECMs are new, uh, the concept is new, but of course the places exist. Um, IUCN and other organizations and people focusing on this have obviously been looking at, as we have, identifying these places and then we'll get into the reporting of them internationally as well. Basically finding them and uh, making them count on the map. But equally importantly, as we've already started getting into in this first session, there is the, the what actually happens to these places beyond identifying and reporting them. And so we've, um, we sort of think of this as there is forms of recognition you can give these areas and there, is form, there are forms of support that you can also offer uh, these places. So I've got, uh, as Vi says, uh, just a presentation to uh, open some of the issues. I'm hoping we're gonna hear as well from a couple of the other resource people, and then uh, I'll, we'll open the floor for comments. Uh, so yeah, already you can start typing into the uh, comment section if you'd like to. So here's the thing, we talk about recognition or providing further recognition for these areas. Um, and that, can, that could occur uh, through, through laws, or policies, or programs, um, or those kinds of things. 
And I've got a good example for you because in, in South Africa, one of the countries that has moved quite quickly on identifying and reporting, or at least identifying OECMs, that they're looking to, to bring or enhance recognition of OECMs through a program, the Biodiversity Stewardship Program. So, oh yeah, here we go. Let me do this for you as well. Um, so actually, uh, none of the countries that have identified OECMs have also developed new laws. Um, none of them have developed new laws. And so as discussed, um, at least on the first day, it's very, it's very possible to move ahead with OECMs without needing to develop new legislation. Having said that, as things develop, particularly as um, as I said on the first day as well, I feel we're slightly between two systems. Uh, there was a singular, largely singular focus on protected areas for conservation. Now OECMs are here, um, things are changing. And so it may be that uh, down the line, countries will decide it is a good idea maybe to um, revise legislation or develop new legislation. Um, again, I, I think that could be a really good opportunity if, if a country felt this is a time to fully revise our area based our approach to area based conservation measure. That could be a very progressive um, thing to happen um, in a country. Um, but as I said, we don't you don't have to do that at all. And um, there may be areas um, or governance authorities that would actually argue against any further kinds of regulation. They would say, look, um, if we are uh, a community governed area, we'd like, as Stacey was just opening up there, we would like um, extra rights, um, or to put another way, our rights to be recognized. Um, but we don't need any OECM related regulations. We are happy to understand there are some standards and we will be working towards those. We want our areas to be recognized as OECMs. We don't want to necessarily be further regulated. So I think that is a real consideration. And as part of that, even um, in some uh, meetings that I've attended, people have said the following, what happens if we move forward, we either self-identify our areas or our, our areas are identified as OECMs, and then down the line, the government regulates OECMs. And guess what? Now our area is, is on the hook or we're on the hook. Our area is going to be further regulated. Um, so that's, that's a very important point to consider. And something, again, as discussed in the last se session here, should be fully thought about and considered. Fortunately, the CBD decision is actually pretty clear about essentially protecting um, OECMs against things like that. And the top uh, paragraph isn't directly from the CBD, but it's close to it. And that is that any kinds of legislation or engagement with OECMs should provide greater support and recognition to existing governance systems and not unnecessarily alter those local arrangements um, that in that, you know, that are, that are proving to be effective. So that is the that's what the CBD is requesting parties and other people to respect. At least that's the principle. Um, and as I say here, there's therefore a positive obligation um, of states and other actors, and I'll definitely include NGOs and other actors, to, in the first instance, you know, fully understand, take time to, to, to be inducted, should we say, in the local relationships between governance, management, and conservation outcomes before suggesting changes or, you know, proposing new ways of doing things. As Heather underscored um, in her uh, presentation, um, well, maybe Stacey as well, any related measures should be developed within a full and effective involvement of, um, of, every, of, of the rights holders and stakeholders. So whilst we've talked about that kind of a principle in terms of local levels, um, equally, um, as a lawyer, I would like to, um, we do see increasingly around the world laws being developed through much more participatory processes. So if 
um, a government agency is considering developing legislation, policies, or programs on OECMs, wouldn't it be good uh, if that kind of a thing was developed with um, all the rights holders and stakeholders involved? Um, and of course, um, at the bottom here, you can see that any legal recognition should be agreed with the legitimate authority as well. FPIC should apply to that kind of thing. Okay, so last two slides on support. It's pretty straightforward that, yes, it's, it's a good principle to say that, you know, if we identify a site, if we are recognizing that site in some way, that site may require or request additional forms of support. Definitely the principle should be that those forms of support should be appropriate. Um, and, uh, and this could include, for example, knowledge, capacity, finance, uh, different forms of training. Um, and as you can see, there are incentives and, and other, other mechanisms to support. But the real key here is appropriate because, um, you know, the, I think the conservation industry has got a lot of examples of inappropriate forms um, of support. And so again, particularly because OECMs, the sites that are recognized or identified as OECMs are places that are working, are places, uh, their the social ecological systems uh, that are seeming to be um, uh, deliver conservation outcomes and livelihoods as well. And therefore, again, any form of support that's offered should be, uh, you know, really sensitively developed and provided. And again, further forms of support may include, um, uh, as, as in fact coming full circle to uh, Stacey's last point there, you know, it may be actually that um, a group may say, look, we, we'd actually like to see our site recognized and, and reported as an OECM. We understand that the government therefore will be able to look good internationally by showing these increased percentage, percentages or having contributed to this target. For that, we would like to um, you know, see greater land tenure or um, uh, use rights um, or some other forms of, of reciprocal relationships um, and I think I can say with some confidence that certainly a process occurring in Canada is running along those lines with Indigenous peoples in Canada very much in some form almost of negotiation with their government about that relationship and that deal which is being done. So I'm going to pause there. Um, I would like to invite one of the resource people um, if you're interested Stacy what Vi Stacy or Paul to chip in first I'd like to give you the option first otherwise we can move to participants Yeah, thanks. Hi everyone, Stacey here. Um, I, I'm just going back to this recognition of rights and potential conflict around that. I mean, I can put a more concrete example of this. I'm a little um, hesitant to do this, but I mean, we don't have anyone from Fiji government on the call right now, but Fiji is a place where things are quite tricky in the marine environment in terms of looking to recon formally recognize a locally managed marine area, either as a formal protected area or as an OECM. Um, in Fiji, this is something that's been written about multiple times that um, it's very clear that the indigenous landowners have rights to access the fishing grounds, but they don't have tenure rights as recognized under the constitution or the Fisheries Act legislation. There was a movement some years ago to um, create a new inshore fisheries. Um, it was going to be a decree. And within that, there was a draft provision that came in and out of various different drafts that I saw 
that would have provided some formal recognition of rights of local communities to create um, community fisheries management plans as long as they were in line with na national fisheries legislation. That provision was removed. The bill has been shelved indefinitely. Um, and so I can foresee, for example, in Fiji, there being some particular issues about the local communities maybe wanting to set up their LMAs as a formally recognized OECM in order to be able to secure the support that comes along with recognition, but perhaps the government being reluctant to allow that to go forward because any any flow of support is sort of a tacit acknowledgement that the local people have rights to make decisions and management rules about that area, which at present goes against the legislation. So I just wanted to ground what I've been talking around in a concrete example, so that maybe you could think about how a little bit better about how this might apply within the countries where you're coming from and how um, these challenges might fit in with your legal frameworks and whether you might need to think about modifying existing frameworks or how you could use the existing frameworks to recognize rights where it's um, appropriate and strengthen those rights. So I'll stop there. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Stacy. So I'm happy to um, simply open this up for some comments. Who would like to? Does that resonate at all? Does that raise any issues um, for you, or does that, or does it feel you know too far off to start discussing this yet? Uh, thank you, Harry. Um, I don't oh, yeah. have anything at this point, but I want to throw it out to my colleagues from Samoa. Yep. Because I know they, they also, uh, I mean, the, uh, uh, close to 90% to, uh, yeah, of, of, of the you know, areas here are under customary ownership. So, you know, in light of, of the, the Fiji situation, uh, and uh, we've also been having some, some uh, controversial um, laws around uh, land tenure and then uh, uh, recently uh, some proposed laws around that uh, so uh, land bill land rights bills and stuff like that but I, I just wanted to to uh, uh, yeah throw that out to to Lino Lino are you there uh, for any perspectives that you uh, could share with the rest of um, uh, the participants and the workshop on this common morning <laughs> Lino, are you there? You can either speak or, or you can type uh, type in the chat if you're having problems uh, with your mic. Uh, no. Can you hear me? Why? Everyone? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Um, so, uh, something. So, so what, was, uh, what was the question? One more, more. We just wanted to get uh, uh, the, the perspective from the Samoan government also, or at least from Samoa um, in relation to land tenure rights, um, you know, especially uh, in, in light of, of, of what Stacy just mentioned um, around uh, the, uh, the tricky nature of, of, of the, uh, you know, land um, tenure, I mean, tenure versus, uh, you know, uh, fishing access rights and stuff like that. So I mean, uh, for Samoa, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to ask what, what uh, you know, what the experience is, because uh, I know that um, there have been some some uh, land bills proposed and how that would affect uh, the or potentially uh, have bearing on the rights of local communities uh, and their access to resources, uh, especially in in uh, in light uh, or in the context of our discussions around around the OECMs. Is that clear to you? Um, yeah, uh, so the government, uh, in terms of land 
uh, tender. I think uh, that it's under the land um, uh, division. But for the uh, development of uh, locals, uh, uh, private owned um, conservation, uh, conservation areas, I think that we use the guidelines from the IUCN to, to establish those uh, uh, based conservation. Uh, but we, for the government, I think we use the uh, local um, legislation through the land, uh, uh, what you call it? the land uh, uh, division. But we don't, under the parks and reserve, we don't have the laws, but it's through the land and land division okay no i'm just following up on that because i understand that i mean even even in in uh setting up marine protected areas there is a bit of a um um how do i put it there there, there is uh, some confusion or it's not really clear uh where the government jurisdiction uh uh, where well, the community jurisdiction ends, or, and when the uh, where the government starts, because I I always understood that uh, uh, the the government uh, claims ownership over uh, those areas under the, the high water mark. So I, I know that's something that has always been uh, a bit of that has caused a bit of friction between local communities and and, and the government, but. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether you have any further information on that, especially in terms of uh, the rights of, of communities uh, uh, in relation to the uh, community-based conservation areas. Uh. Um, I, th I think oh, my mic on. Yeah. Uh, mm. Oh, you don't have to answer that uh, right away. Just oh, have a yeah. think about it. Then you can put yeah. your, your, your response in the chat. But uh, Harry, I think we can move on uh, if there are others uh, who would like to contribute. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I understand if this this question, the, the main thing for me for this session, I just wanted to bring it to your attention because I know full well that over, um, you know, the next few years and when OECMs are, are further discussed, I know there's going to be a focus, understandably, initially on identifying them uh, and reporting them. And um, if nothing else, what I'd like you to take away from this little piece of our discussion is, you know, be the person in the room um, who says, this is great um we let's 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 involve ourselves and and with all those considerations we've discussed over the last two days about about identifying and subsequently reporting these errors but let's also talk about different forms of recognition what might be beneficial what perhaps might not be beneficial and also about appropriate forms of support for these areas and i think that um if um, you were to do that one fine day, that would be, you know, you would be serving um, that meeting uh, very well by doing that and, and just reminding the, the, the participants of that future meeting that we need to identify and report, but we also need to recognize and support. So having underscored that, I'll open it up again in case anybody else would would like to comment otherwise i would just suggest that's the takeaway um yeah yeah great thanks for that yeah okay great um would anybody yeah would anybody uh, like harry to if i in? can yeah yeah go on yeah please yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, I just wanted to, to make a point or mention that um, as most of you or some of you at least will know that um, through the project through Biopharma, we're going through a process of preparing a state of protected areas report. Um, one of the chapters focuses on law and governance. 
And I guess one of the the take home uh, messages or, or conclusions from that chapter is that across the region, there is a, a great diversity of um, legislative mechanisms that are applied to create um, the report focuses on protected and conserved areas, so it focuses on both, um, potentially OECMs as well. Um, but the take home is that there is a diversity of legislative instruments and arrangements that are being, or frameworks that are being used to designate um, area-based conservation within the region. And the extent to which customary ownership is recognized also varies greatly. So for example, the uh, the situation in Tonga, um, the situation in Fiji versus countries such as um, Vanuatu and Solomon Islands and PNG. Um, so I guess the point that I'd like to make is that, you know, there might be existing, it's not just a case of, of I guess, thinking about new mechanisms that uh, might be used to recognize OECMs, but there might also be existing mechanisms as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that. And uh, yeah, are there any other burning, burning comments, suggestions? In which case, um, back to you, Vi, for pulling those two things together for the next agenda item. Thanks very much. Thank you, Harry, and thank you, colleagues, participants, for, for your feedback on Agenda Item 4 and the discussions around that. Um, quite a lot of things have come out of, of both these um, uh, discussions, and uh, I, I, it's been hard for me to, to try to extract exactly um, any sort of key point, I, I didn't actually have the time to do that because I was taking notes at the same time. But I think uh, going back to what uh, uh, um, Heather's earlier presentation and the session on that, I think there's been a, a, a wide range of responses around uh, who could do the assessment. We have local NGO reps, local government representatives, community leaders, um, but I think uh, one of the, the biggest uh, things that have come out commonly around this is that it has to be a multi-stakeholder process, uh, engaging those also who have the necessary information needed uh, for the assessment to, to be uh, successful, uh, including those who have tenure rights. Um, so this also includes government authorities, part NGOs and community-based organizations. Uh, we also heard from uh, how the big NGOs based in the region, for example, WW uh, Pacific, uh, could support um, uh, this work on the ground through a lot of the initiatives and support networks that they have uh, in country um, and also uh, uh, within the region. Um, uh, we had some specific examples of, of who needs to be involved, uh, like for example, from the Cook Islands uh, and moving forward with their OCM process. Um, they did note that uh, one of the issues uh, there for them um, and uh, effectively engaging with, with uh, and getting this done was the remoteness of some of the outer islands. Um, but I think uh, one of the most important things is that uh, Traditional leaders have to be, uh, you know, center uh, stage there, and uh, those internal discussions uh, uh, with the island councils uh, would be something that the national government, uh, uh, through the National Environment Service, would handle. Uh, they also mentioned the the, the EZ Marine Park or Marine Moana, which is uh, uh, another agency that could conduct the assessments as well as with other ministries. Uh, in terms of issues um, to be considered, we had consent of government governance authorities. Um, the considerations about process, or what, what sort of meetings, consultations, or workshops need to be held? How do we manage the expectations of, of communities? 
um, in terms of clearly driving home what the impl implementation, I mean, the imp implications of, of, of being designated as OCM involves, uh, what are the benefits, what are the challenges that they could expect to face. Again, I think it's quite important that uh, the right people are involved. Uh, again, going back to who the right landowners are. Um, I think some of the other uh, points raised here, land ownership issues, um, indicators of effectiveness and equity, and how to best measure these, also incorporating local knowledge and worldviews. Uh, Bottom-up approach was also raised. Um, uh, so, yeah, being driven by uh, the community and the local governance authority who were the initiators of the process. Um, again, we'll go back to making sure that uh, it is a participatory process uh, with the communities, uh, affected communities, ownership from local communities, and recognition of OECMs uh, to drive the process. Um, again, we had uh, the example of Tonga, which I, I was quite interested in, but it's good to have some clarity that uh, um, the decision resides uh, with the, the nobles uh, there. Um, again, uh, there was an important point, I think, that, that uh, Stacy raised, I think, about around the, the, some communities uh, who may use the OECM recognition process as a way to secure rights uh, over an area. Again, I think the, the important uh, point that came out of there is that it's important to, to verify whether these communities in questions do have rightful claims over, over the area concerned. Um, and I think there was another point raised that, uh, uh, that um, multiple groups may claim ownership over the same area. Um, so it makes uh, the process of identifying who really does uh, lay claim to the area a big challenge, which could be very, very time consuming in the long drawn up process. In terms of uh, Harry's session, I think um, what, um, well, uh, really hasn't come to surprise uh, uh, in, in my case, is that uh, it was uh, good. To, I mean, imp uh, interesting to note that a lot of the countries that have moved forward with OECM uh, recognition at this point have not developed any new laws. Um, and I guess uh, it also goes back to the point that you raised that uh, there, there, there may be benefits in, in, in not doing so, of not being regulated. Um, and then that sort of raises for me the issue of recognition versus regulation. Um, and whether that is a valid point. I think another thing that you mentioned was um, designating OECMs and then having them regulated by national government down the line. We need to be clear about what the implications of that would mean. Um, and also looking at uh, any related support measures need uh, that uh, free and prior, prior informed consent of the communities uh, involved and the local governance authorities. Um, I note uh, in all of this, um, the differences in, in, in uh, tenure rights and, 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 and the degree of the, the access levels in some countries, uh, citing the um, example that Stacy mentioned from Fiji. Um, and then I also fully agree with what, what Paul um, uh, mentioned that in addition to any new uh, support measures uh, for, for, for the recognition of OECMs, it's, it's important for us to realize and recognize that there is a diversity of arrangements that exist and frameworks uh, within the region that could be used to complement uh, any new measures uh, in designating area-based conservation, uh, conservation initiatives on the ground. So that's just my... Uh, a uh, rough summary of, of the discussions uh, of the key sort of points that I sort of uh, uh, plucked out of uh, items three and four. Again, if if you uh, if any of the participants have any uh, other observations, you can uh, voice those now or you can put them in the chat window.
If not, hey, five, I'll see you later. Five, five, I added oh, a couple sorry. there in the chat. I added a couple there in the chat, five. Thanks. Thank you, Nate. You're on mute, bro. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just keep uh, keep any uh, any points that you have coming uh, in the chat. That we'll also capture those in the notes as well uh, in relation to this session. But um, in the interest of time, we'll be moving on to session five now. Or, um, sorry, session six on reporting data on OECNs. So this will be a joint presentation by Heather and myself. Um, so I'll hand it over to Heather now um, for her presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Vi. Um, so sharing my screen. OK, so um, this won't take very long, um, but I'm just going to give you a bit of an introduction to um, a part of the process that kind of comes quite a long way in. So it's after all these other points we've been discussing about identifying potential OECMs, getting the consent of the governance authority to do an assessment, assessing the OECM, concluding that it definitely is an OECM, and then you would come to this part, which is reporting it to the World Database on other effective area-based conservation measures. So, um, as I mentioned on the first day, uh, the CBD decision um, that adopted the definition of OECMs also requested that UNEP WCMC develop a data set uh, of OECMs to complement the World Database on Protected Areas. Um, so that's what we've done, and countries have started reporting. Um, this slide just shows the example of the Philippines. Um, basically, when countries report data on OECMs, it means that we can uh, showcase that data through the Protected Planet website alongside their Protected Areas data. So the orange areas you can see here are the OECMs. Uh, that the Philippines has um, provided uh, alongside its protected areas in green and blue. And it also means that we can uh, factor in that data when we calculate indicators on progress towards previously IG target 11 and in future uh, the draft target 3. So how to report. Um, once an OECM has been identified, it can be reported to the World Database on OECMs. Um, that process is most often done by the national government uh, and data needs to be provided in a specific format. Um, so I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about that format, but um, you'll get a copy of these slides later and you'll be able to access the link that's on the screen. Uh, which is the manual for the World Database on Protected Areas and World Database on OECMs. Um, and that manual basically goes through everything that you need uh, to know in order to report data. So there's three key steps. Um, the first one is something we've been over quite a lot already, but obtaining consent. Uh, the governance authority, as well as giving their consent for an assessment to take place, should give consent for their the data so the boundary and the descriptive information about the area that they're managing um, they should give their consent for that information to be shared and they should be aware that it's going to be made public so anyone can access uh, and download that information uh, the second step is to format the data correctly uh, using the manual that i just mentioned uh, and in the case of the pacific the third step is to send the data to sprep um, and SPREP collate data from the region uh, for the World Database on Protected Areas and World Database on OECMs, and they share it with UNEP WCMC. Um, and Vi will go into a bit more detail in a few minutes on uh, what that process involves. So there's three key things that you need to provide. Um, the first is GIS data or spatial data. So in order for an OECM to be added to the database, it has to have um, a polygon boundary 
uh, or at the very least it has to have a point location representing the central latitude longitude location of the OECM. Um, it also has to have uh, some tabular data associated with it, um, which is quite basic information, it's things like the name and the governance type. Um, but it can also include uh, a link to additional, more detailed information. So, <clears throat> for example, if you have gone through a thorough assessment uh, and uh, looked at all the, the ways in which the site meets each criterion of the OECM definition, uh, and if you've written that up as a report, then you can provide a link to that report. And that just means that anyone accessing the information has uh, additional insights into why that site is being listed as an OECM. And the third thing is um, something that Vi will talk about, which is uh, just a couple of other documents that are required um, in terms of uh, sort of data contributor agreements that um, SPREP need, need you to provide alongside the data. And again, all of this is described in the manual. Um, this is a lot of text and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but I just wanted to show you um, what the tabular information that you need to provide is. Um, if you have ever provided uh, data to the WDPA, then this will look very familiar because most of it is exactly the same. Um, so a couple of key things, uh, you need to provide um, the, the name of the site uh, and the designation. Um, in the case of, the, of OECMs, the designation isn't necessarily OECM. Um, as we've been discussing, OECMs covers a sort of a wide range of different types of sites. Um, so, for example, this might be watershed management area or it might be LMMA or uh, community fishery, for example. Um, you also need to provide information on the area. Um, there's a bit of information about whether there's a no-to-take zone could be quite relevant for coastal OECMs in the region. Uh, information on whether the site is legally designated. Again, that could be quite relevant um, based on the discussions we've just been having. Um, it's very important to note that there's the option to uh, to, for this field to be established. So the status can be established which means that the OECM exists and is recognized, but it isn't legally designated. So in submitting data to the OECM database, there's no assumption that those sites are legally designated, um, but they do of course have to exist and have been assessed as meeting the definition of an OECM. Um, and then there's just a few other fields which describe things like the governance type, which is, generic, so it's, it's local communities or it's national ministry or agency, for example, um, ownership type uh, and information on the management authority and of course on the country. Uh, and then the two fields that are different to the World Database on Protected Areas are conservation objectives and supplementary information. So supplementary information is the one I mentioned a moment ago, where you can link to additional details on why the site is considered an OECM. Uh, and conservation objectives uh, is um, a way to categorize OECMs based on their objectives. So we talked about this a little bit earlier in the workshop, but um, a, a minority of OECMs might have conservation as a primary objective. Uh, many will have it as a, a secondary man management objective. Uh, and others will not have it as an objective at all, but still result in conservation as a result of the other objectives that they do have. Um, and that is as much detail as I'm going to go into for now, um, but I'm going to pass over to Vi, who will talk a bit more about this from the SPREP side. Thanks. Heather, can I ask a question? Of course. Your attribute schema is different, isn't it, the OE, for OECMs compared to the protected areas? It is very similar. So um, supplementary information and conservation objectives are two new fields that we've added. The yeah. other fields are all also in the WDPA. Um, a couple of them have slightly different values that are accepted. Um, so, for example, IUCN management category is always not applicable for OECMs because those categories only apply to protected areas. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so there's a question in the chat from Dave asking if an OECM is not to be considered M an MPA. Um, that's correct. So OECMs and protected areas should not be in the same place, shouldn't overlap. Um, OECMs are complementary to protected areas um, and, well, they're complementary but different, so they shouldn't be, um, an MPA shouldn't be an OECM and an OEC OECM shouldn't be an MPA. Uh, hello, colleagues. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, not at the moment, but I did. Can you see it now? Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to move forward with the presentation uh, in terms of uh, the time that we have. Okay, let me get the <laughs> thing to move. Okay, can you all see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, just uh, carrying on from uh, Heather's presentation, I just wanted to give you a, a, just an overview of, of what's expected uh, from SPREP side as well in, in terms of the process uh, for reporting OECMs from the region. Um, briefly, I just wanted to outline that uh, SPREP does have a data sharing group uh, with uh, UNEP WCMC, which we began our partnership back in 2017. And since then, uh, 10 data updates across eight uh, ACP countries have been assisted, uh, completed, and are now reflected on the world database on protected areas. Currently, we have um, one uh, in, uh, data review uh, in progress, uh, and is pending, that's uh, from uh, Vanuatu. Uh, we've just initiated one in-country review process uh, for uh, uh, Federal States of Micronesia, and we have a, a further three in-country consultancies, so Kiribati, Marshall Islands, and Fiji uh, in progress. Um, because of the COVID situation, we felt that um, uh, the in-country consultancy approach uh, is the best way to go. And it has been working uh, quite well so far uh, for us uh, with, with relation to our other um, initiatives and programs. So um, once, uh, these uh, um, reviews above uh, are completed. This will bring the number of countries uh, in the region. Uh, we've completed the updates on the WPA close to 90%. Um, and so the process for reviewing and updating uh, 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 um, identified OECMs, designated OECMs from the region will be similar to that of uh, the current reporting on protected areas to the WPA. Um, and I just want to make the point that together, uh, combined uh, the w, uh, World Database on OECMs and the World Database on Protected Areas put together provides a very powerful and comprehensive uh, picture of uh, the Pacific's current conservation network and, and, and uh, protected area and conservation area OECM state. This just gives you uh, an idea of the workflow that we have right now in terms of uh, handling and, and validating the data. It all starts with national data providers uh, and, um, with, and through data sharing agreements and licensing, we are able to handle and process their data uh, through workflow uh, with WDPA and then also uh, relay that information back to, to national data providers uh, to assist appropriate decision-making uh, either through access to the uh, national environment portals for the INFORM project, 
disorders through the Pacific Islands, particularly area portal and the uh, protected uh, planet at the global level. Uh, again, uh, there are some elements of this workflow that need to be reality checked. We have found that uh, some things uh, are not working quite as well or could be improved. So uh, this workflow on paper right now, we will have to look at uh, uh, making some amendments to it based on our current experience. In terms of the detailed elements of the data review process, uh, we do need some uh, uh, initial information from countries. So that includes, uh, would probably include a copy uh, of, of your um, agreed OECM list, uh, either in Excel format with the descriptive information that, that um, Heather mentioned earlier, uh, the spatial uh, files as well. Uh, but what we need uh, in terms of official notifications uh, is a, uh, a letter, official letter, uh, requesting our assistance uh, to handle your data and providing consent for SPEP to handle the, the data uh, um, and um, also um, providing that uh, the standard uh, data contributor agreement um, of which a template is available from, from WCMC. And then we also would need a consent letter uh, from the local government's authority, which, uh, which uh, demonstrates uh, free and prior informed consent uh, for moving forward and having these areas uh, designated and recognized. Um, I won't go into the last part, but it's really just the, 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 um, the process of relaying that information through official channels yet spread. Um, so it's a three-pronged process usually. Uh, the first, uh, the initial review is, is about four to five working days. Of course, this will vary according to uh, the, 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 the timing of feedback uh, from, from the parties concerned. Uh, so once the information is uh, received from SPREP, um, we relay it to the WCMC and then they conduct an initial review and make, uh, as Heather mentioned, uh, just to make sure that the information that's provided um, is um, plugged into the uh, uh, OECM schema template, and, and uh, Heather showed you that earlier, the different fields um, that they will be using to present the information at the global level. So after the initial review, um, WCMC gets in touch uh, with the government focal point concern or the initiator of the, of the OECM uh, process uh, regarding any clarifications that needed, and they copy us into uh, uh, all of the correspondence. Um, and one good thing about uh, the WCNC process is that they provide constructive advice uh, to countries uh, so that, you know, it really, and it really does help um, uh, to, to, to move the process along. So that, that the constructive advice in applying suggested changes is, is something that I think has been working really well. Um, the second review, um, this is, um, could be warranted and it's something uh, that would be necessary if any gaps are uh, remaining from the initial review. So if this is required, uh, uh, us here at SPIP will conduct uh, that, that review. And so the last process is, is processing the site update on the world database. This takes a few weeks usually. Um, so if the, the, the secondary review is bypassed, and then UNEP or UCNC will pr uh, proceed to update uh, uh, the OECM or, or OECMs on the World Database, after which they will um, notify the country um, government focal point concerned and also will uh, reveal which version of the World Database the site will be featured in, uh, in case um, the, the country would like to um, run any uh, public awareness or publicity around uh, uh, that, that designation on at the global level. So that's just uh, in a nutshell, uh, yeah, uh, what the requirements are reporting uh, uh, when we, as and when countries move on to uh, that, that part of the process. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we'll take one or two questions because I know that we don't have much time left.
Any questions? Vi, just a, just a question from, from me, Paul here. If, if for example, um, any of the countries were interested in, um, I guess, potentially documenting their, their, their OECMs, um, what's what's the best way? Is it just a case of emailing you and you'd be happy to, to start that conversation and support them? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, um, well, in, in relation to the support that we can provide um, in initiating the process, um, I mean, a, a, apart from the, the, those reporting, uh, supporting the reporting requirements of OECMs, um, yeah, certainly I'd be happy to, to help countries initiate uh the process of course you know we know that based on the feedback that we've seen today that there are other players that can also provide that that support uh especially those who are based in country um uh, that could provide that technical advice and, and uh, other forms of initial support to get the process uh, rolling so it is it will be a collaborative effort but uh from our side um, yeah I, I am happy to to help out where where necessary Um, just to add, uh, UNEP WCMC is also very happy to provide advice and guidance um, and, and to help out in that way. Thank you, Heather. Um, I am mindful that we have nine minutes left, so uh, I want to hand it over to Paul. Uh, Paul, how uh, it looks like we may not have enough time uh, to go into country groups for the next steps. So I welcome your feedback or advice on how, how we handle the, the next uh, uh, agenda item. Or any other uh, suggestions from the rest of the team? Yeah, Vi, as a, as a suggestion, um, given that time is pretty short and um, we do have colleagues here that it's getting um, quite late in the evening, maybe we could just have a, a group discussion, all of us, a uh, plenary discussion for maybe five minutes and then we can we can wrap up the, the session if everybody's happy with that. Yeah, sounds good. Are participants happy with that approach? Thomas Kim. Okay. Well, just to kick it off um, uh, and, and initiate uh, while stimulating some discussion, I think that um, one of the, the good things that we've done over the last two days was to, to familiarize, uh, you know, with the the screening methodology. So I think that's something that we that could be continued because um, I know you know we uh, there may be there are other parts of, of the screening methodology that we didn't get to, but I think uh, it's a work in progress. So I would encourage countries to uh, continue on with that. Um, and also I think another thing that we would have to look at based on your use of the, and going back to the, the, the tentative lists of potential uh, OECMs that you identified in the, in the group, breakout groups yesterday, uh, it would be good to, to also consider and look further at that list to consolidate uh, any specific, I mean, to try to narrow it down and, uh, as much as you can uh, from that broader list that you uh, already created. Any other points from, from the rest of uh, participants based on uh, the experience of the last two days of what you are going to do to move the process along in, in, over the next couple of months? 
This could also include uh, any, any support you may need from, 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 from the team um, with any aspect of, of the process. Hey, this is Nate here. Could I throw in? Yeah. Go ahead, I Nate. That, yeah, thanks. That my experience uh, with WDPA and the um, SPREP and <clears throat> working with protected areas across the Pacific has been fantastic and amazing over all these years and learning so much. I, one of the big things that I've learned is this definition of a protected area. And I guess it comes down to like, I see some comments here in the, in the chat thread about that. Because like if the IUCN definition of a protected area is, I think it was stated in day one of our training about it being the primary thing is for biodiversity conservation. Like that's the goal for it to be defined as a protected area. And the reality is that we know a lot of our sites in the Pacific that's not the primary goal. The primary goal is about food security, or fish or trees or something. <clears throat> so, but then like, as I see here in the chat, and I know that from my experience that um, the government can define and say, well, yeah, that's a protected area, but in reality it's not. And I guess the example that I would pick up on is, is from Palau, because I don't think we have any Palauans on the call. Um, they're giant marine, but they, you know, it shows up on the map as a protected area, quote unquote, protected area, that it's there for biodiversity conservation. But we, it's not, like the reality is it's not, it's, it's just fishery zone and there, it, it's really an OECM. So I think it's kind of an interesting observation and I'll pause here is that, you're a protected area or you're not. And if you're not, well, then you're an OECM. And that's great. Be an OECM. Lots of good outcomes can still come from that. But we have this language that we've been stuck with for a long time and how people might interpret protected area. You know, in the Pacific, my experience is folks say, well, if it's protected, that means I can't use it. So I don't want to call it that. So it's, I don't know how to, get around that dance between these terms but um there's some baggage that we need to carry with us to uh you know control expectations and assumptions about how a, an area is managed um so just observations for me the the conversation and the this week has been really helpful i think oecms are a great way forward for a lot of our areas um nutting out the the language around them is, I think, a challenge. And uh, as I've commented a few times this week about the, the governance and how national government's going to play with that and how they're going to accept it. So I'm thankful that we've had Agnetha as a, a trusted government representative that's intimately familiar with this stuff. Um, thanks, everyone, for the discussion this week. I hope to keep it going. Cheers. Thank you, Nate. Paul, over to you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Vi. Thank you, everybody. Um, unfortunately, this uh, draws the workshop to a close, um, which is a real shame. Um, I, I hope that you found it interesting, um, informative, and uh, most importantly, beneficial, um, but also, I hope that this is the first step in um, potentially progressing, exploring um, the documentation of OECMs in your respective countries. I think it's something that, that could potentially be quite important for the region. Uh, for, for me, I just wanted to share with you some of the, the take home messages that I, that I picked up over the last three days. Um, and, and hopefully it's the same for you, but obviously we all come away from training and workshops with different things, but I wanted to share your mind. Uh, the first one is that uh, OECMs are areas um, that provide in situ conservation benefits, but do not fall under the definition of a protected area. Um, the second one is that OECMs provide or present uh, an opportunity to 
support national reporting um, under the CBD, but they also, and this is potentially more important, they also provide uh, an opportunity to support local communities to sustainably manage the resources. Uh, the third one is, and this one's really important as well, is that it's really important that these areas, OECMs, um, their documentation is done with the consent um, of the local governance authority, um, including indigenous communities and the participation of, of relevant stakeholders. Uh, the next one is that the screening tool presented by, by Harry um, can be a really useful, um, I guess, guidance um, for you if you would like to progress OECMs in your country. Um, as, you, as you know, this is from the draft site level uh, methodology for identifying other effective area-based conservation measures, the draft that, that Harry showed us earlier. Um, we will be, we'll share that with you when that's, that's finalized. Um, and the last point that I picked up, which I thought was really important, and, and Harry really highlighted this, was that it's not just about documenting these areas. Um, it's really important that uh, we go to the next step, and that's considering how these areas are, are recognized, what mechanism they're recognized, and how they can be supported. This is particularly important for, for local communities or locally managed areas. Uh, so they were my take homes from, from this workshop, um, as I said. Um, so what I'd like to, to ask you all to do now is to complete the survey. Um, Laura posted a link in the, the chat box, which you may see. Um, I'd be really grateful if you could complete that. Um, the reason that we're asking you to do this, it's, it's, um, uh, it's confidential. We don't know what you say or what you do. It's not linked to who you are. Um, but the reason we're asking you to do it is because it helps us um, all from our respective organizations, um, SPREP, WCMC, IUCN, to better design and I guess deliver these sorts of, of workshops. We want to improve what we're doing um, and we want to provide information that and do it in a way that provides a benefit to you. So please do um, jump on it now. It should only take a couple of minutes um, to, to complete. It's really quick, just a, a number of very quick questions. So please, um, if you could complete that now. Uh, the, the next point that I wanna make is that, uh, and we touched on it a little bit before, but if you do want any more information about OECMs, please do reach out to, to myself or Vi or Heather, um, we would all be more than happy to help you uh, and continue the discussion about potential next steps um, of the, you know, the documentation of OECMs. Um, and finally, uh, I wanted to thank the, the workshop team. So I wanted to thank uh, Laura, Ben, Vi, Heather, Harry, and Stacey. Um, I think they did a really fantastic job over the last three days. So I really appreciate that. Uh, and, and lastly, I wanted to thank all of you for joining the, the workshop um, and wish you a, a good day ahead. So thank you and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Paul. I just wanted to, to uh, add that uh, we will be putting all the presentations and uh, related materials in the Google Drive that we will share for you for your access to these. Um, so look forward to that as well as the um, uh, the recordings of the of the training over the three days. We will provide you with access uh, shortly. And I will be in touch regarding the next steps uh, to get uh, some further thoughts uh, from you all on, on how we uh, progress this for the region and for your respective countries. So thank you once again for your great participation and contributions of the last uh, three days. And thank you again to the excellent uh, resource team. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye.